Welcome back to another Human Humane Architecture show here in downtown Honolulu. Our urban fabric of, uh, we have the fourth largest skyline in the United States of America, 462 high rises. This show uh, I've been thinking about might actually be my most challenging one, but also maybe my most relevant one. And I'm sitting here by myself. Usually I have a guest, and I have a guest with me as well today, but I have him in my mind. And if Zira could show uh, picture number one, we see today's guest who is sort of virtually and spiritually with us. And his name, as in the announcement, his name is Jeff. And you would say, well, what's his last name? And I have to say, I don't know. And my excuse would be, I don't have to know because Sometimes people close to you in an urban fabric are neighbors, and so is Jeff. And you don't necessarily need to know their names, their last names. You know their first names, and that's enough to communicate with them. So Jeff is a neighbor. I'm a resident of Waikiki, which is our tourist uh, epicenter in our metropolis of Honolulu. And I got to know Jeff a while ago when I was going to the beach and taking a shower. And uh, because the shower was clocked, you know, frequently with, with sand, he uh, put himself to work and cleaned the shower for us. And uh, we all knew Jeff doing that. And whenever he wasn't working, he just, you know, relaxed and recharged for his other shift. And at some point, um, Jeff was gone and we were all worried. And um, at some point I saw him again and I approached him and he said, well, city people came and uh, asked him to go away because he wasn't authorized to clean the shower. So I guess that was that. And um, made me think already, you know, if some, you know, informed and engaged citizens volunteer their, their time and their, their work, why wouldn't we want to accept that? Because actually the city people aren't cleaning the showers uh, often enough, which was the reason to begin with, to have Jeff uh, basically volunteer. I uh, met Jeff again uh, a while later uh, where he um, talked more about himself and his life, which really touched me. And I'm really hoping at some point we can get, get Jeff on the show and he can talk about that himself. Uh, himself. And so I won't, I won't steal his show today. But it was very touching. Uh, Jeff then found another job. And this here is uh, uh, and maybe even next picture, Zuri, as well, shows it even more activated. Uh, this, is, this is Jeff at work. His workplace is at the corner of Kapahulu and Kalakaua. There are these setbacks in the pavement, and Jeff thought this is a good place to start some business. Uh, soon after he did that, um, some people from the business behind, which you, can, you already saw in the back, it's an ABC store, basically came and approached him to go away. Once again, he wasn't authorized to have a business there. And um, so I started to have a discussion with the building manager of Park Shore Hotels, which was very interesting. And he was saying he was happy to talk to me because usually he only has discussions with people who only see one side. The tourists he hosts only want to see, they don't want to see Jeff, they only want to see the ABC store. And um, he thinks, or they, you know, that's, that's the approach of the management. And um, so, or the, the people who do businesses like that, you know, don't want to hear about anything else. So this is conflict. And, and so we were talking and saying we understand both sides. So we try to, to mitigate. At that time, I had started to ask Jeff if he would be okay to be on a show. And he was getting very excited about it. And it was around Mother's Day, he started to, uh, you saw the, is there, if you can bring the picture back, um, you saw the planters, and he started to plant additional plants. Once again, ABC employees, probably not on their own initiative, but, you know, being told to, came out and asked him once again to stop doing that. It happened to be Mother's Day, so I happened to come around. He was happy to see me, and he basically said, um, you know, this is the guy I'm doing this for because I'm going to look good here in my business because it's going to be shown on TV. And at that point, it dawned to me that it was a little absurd that there is someone trying to plant a plant in a planter and once again is told he's not supposed to, and I exchanged these thoughts with the ABC people and later on with the Park Shore 
manager. And um, so these are, I think, you know, things that we, you know, he he does he blends in, right? He uh, he tries to fit in, he tries to integrate himself, all these terms uh, into into our life, but uh, is is given a hard time. I like to make a cut here and uh, switch over to a project. And that starts with uh, picture number three. And this is a collaboration between myself as a critical practitioner, as an architect, and teaming up with uh, the emerging generations of architectural students. This is a product of a class I'm teaching every spring. I'm privileged to teach up at UH. And you see at the very bottom the names of the team. And um, you see this picture tries to capture, you know, this show is really about principally to say, this is the most beautiful place on earth. We're blessed and nature is stunning. And that, that's what that top uh, row of a slice of a bamboo grove illustrates. And you know, the point of the show is why isn't our built environment equally beautiful? And we want to investigate that. And it's actually, in all honesty, that's how Jay, our boss here, approached me and says, Martin, your, your projects need to be more exposed. They, they need to get out there and we potentially even need them to become reality. So this particular project here tries to say, why can't we create dwellings, places where we can live in harmony and taking advantage of the beauty of our very special place here in Hawaii. So this picture here is a suggestion, you know? It's just like, my, my question is, wouldn't you like to be in there? And hopefully some of you would say, oh, that looks good. It's just what we need. We obviously see nature, we're blended with nature, we see human activity, and we see some shelter, you know, but we just see a roof pretty much. We don't, other, everything else is, is, is pretty open. And the next uh, picture, number five, is, uh, is showing, once again, this human activity and event. So this building, if it even can be called building, isn't worried about how it looks like. It's, it cares about how it, how it works. And this is like, you know, we live, we're dominated by Asian culture here. I should say influenced and informed and inspired. And this, you know, uh, basically, uh, is inspired by that, dwells upon that literally and figuratively. So you have um, tatami mats and builds in and you integrate things into the floor. And you know, at the, at the boundaries of the periphery, you have some more enclosed space which could accommodate for uh, uh, human activities and event that are more uh, temporary um, as a bathroom, a bedroom. But mainly you live, once again, outside. Um, we, we call this the ideal ohana type. We know that we're very family-based here and with the high cost of living um, uh, being a challenge, you know, the more people can live together, the more we can share resources and, and also a real estate space. So the, the next picture looks at it from the outside and, you know, you really see you're kind of curious what you see, and that's, it's, it looks more like texture, and that's one of the phrases we use that we take. Maybe here in Hawaii it could be architecture versus architecture. Architecture is hard and static, and Zuri had put in the term easy breezy architecture. So maybe a bamboo grove landscape, um, um, plants are dynamic, they're alive. They're beautiful to look at, but they're also beautiful to be in and under. So that's what this sort of uh, human shelter here tries to um, be inspired by. Our next uh, picture is about is about community. That um, it's maybe you know the most important part that um, if if we live here and we don't have to be trapped inside. We can take advantage of the outdoors, and we should be out and about. And uh, maybe we shouldn't be afraid of each other to, to see each other. If uh, I learned once at a building called city council meeting that Howard Wig, who is a co-host of mine with this great show 
Code Green, and we had him a guest on this show uh, short, um, just very recently, um, had, had once um, um, one of the members of the committee talk to me and say, you know, Martin, actually the problem with, we have with invasive architecture that's hermetic might be a social problem because we stopped uh, accepting that we can hear each other at certain times. And so we built it up walls. And when we were building up walls, we couldn't breathe anymore. So we brought in the machine, which we traditionally call air conditioning, to help with that. So he made the point that it's a, more than a mechanical problem or more than a human comfort problem. It initially is a social problem. So this project thinks about getting back to the roots of um, living outdoors, of using, you know, maybe lowering our voice when, you know, we don't want to have anyone hearing us, but also using vegetation as a mitigator. Uh, that's the way we used to live. Howard always points that out, and it might be worth uh, look, looking back into that. Um, and this picture illustrates even more that the architecture wouldn't even be um, in your face. It would be in the background. It would be background architecture. Maybe it's not even architecture. It's just texture, as said before. It's, it's blending in. It's something that has structure, and so has nature, as you see you know, here, illustrated by, by the team here. And this was Filippa, who was from Chile. So this was a very intercultural team. So it wasn't only comprised of, you know, people, our school, our classes are very diverse, so, so Philippa very masterly, everyone else as well, illustrated the sort of very gentle, blending in, smooth uh, way of dwelling there, that the architecture has structure, it has texture, so as nature has, but they're kind of in line with each other, they kind of learn from each other, but none of the two, you know, wants to be like the other one or look like the other one. This picture here is, for me, the best situation uh, to talk about maybe the most provocative project. And Zuri had subtitled you know, this here as nomadic uh, dwelling uh, before. And here we go again. Thank you. So nomadic means that we, the, the Western civilization thinks about, um, I need to be permanent. I need to own. I need to occupy. I need to occupy land. But maybe not. Hawaiian culture, to my understanding, the concept of ownership didn't exist to begin with. Everything was shared. Um, it was inclusive, which is another term we show uh, as a title here. There we go. And so maybe going back to that, and you know, if not everything is permanent but more dynamic, maybe buildings don't have to be either. Once you set them in stone, you pour them in concrete, they have to last, and it's hard for them to go away uh, in the concept of capitalism that's very kind of problematic. So this project here um, is, is suggested to be like a flash mob concept, that these buildings can basically pop up. They pop up unexpectedly at a corner, at a, f at a free lot that we actually have plenty, which for whatever reasons, haven't been sort of used to, to densify the city. So we can maybe use these lots temporarily and just build these structures. You can come, you can come and, and put them up. And how are we going to do that? I'm going to talk about that after the short break. So see you back soon to Human Humane Architecture and Jeff's show. Aloha everyone, I hope you've been watching ThinkTech Hawaii, but I'm here to invite you to watch me on Viva Hawaii every Monday at 3 p.m. I'm waiting for you. Mahalo. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on ThinkTech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. 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 My name is Richard Emery, and I host Condo Insider. We talk about issues facing the Condo Association throughout Hawaii and talk about solutions. When you think about it, about one-third of our population lives in some form of common interest real estate. We broadcast every Thursday at 3 p.m. Please tune in. Tune in, and thank you. Aloha.
Welcome back to FinTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. Today, speaking on behalf of Jeff and myself, uh, we talk about a project here that before the break I called a flash mob um, approach. And so these buildings would pop up. They, they're structured in a way that a crane can assemble them uh, very easily in a couple of hours or a few days. It can deassemble, then it can reassemble them. So that is something that is maybe of potential and that's how they would look like. So I hope you agree that maybe the owner of the project wouldn't have to be opposed to that because this is not a I for. This is maybe something pleasant and maybe could bring attention uh, to the lot and maybe that way we're living in a capitalized society can raise the property value so when the owner decides to permanently bend on the building or he decides or she decides to keep that they, they could move on. So that's the approach and once again we see we see uh, enlightened outdoor space that is framed by and, and hold up by some semi-enclosed space. Uh, the, the next picture then shows that, you know, this, this and it looks, it, it even looks, you know, fancy. It's glowing, it's attractive, there's something compelling about it. But at the, at daytime, if you go to Zuri to pitch uh, 12, to picture 12, we can see that they look very nondescript and, um, and, and blend in very much. They almost look like trees, uh, artificial trees, um, you, you could say. So very, very different approach to architecture, maybe even a non-architectural approach, yet they're very tectonic. And um, yeah, so is there, if uh, you can go to page 12 again, try that, there we go. So they even look like trees, and if, if you have an abstract perception of it, by the way, that class is called tree architecture. So we try to think about how can we design with how nature thinks. And since we're, we're human beings, they won't look like trees because trees are trees and architecture is architecture. But the principle of nature as being self-sufficient and the synthesis of performance and, and form, we try to take inspiration from. Um, so here you see our artificial trees uh, behind natural trees. Uh, this is a suggestion for School Street, uh, very far. Um, out there where the neighborhood is kind of challenged. So this gives an indication that these could be um, occupied, could be occupied by people who are otherwise cut out by society and dwellings, but they look very desirable, at least we think. And nature, as you can see in the little sprinkling green, is integrated, is infused. So there's like uh, gardening, uh, there's agriculture, that's, that's self-performed, uh, integrated into the building. If you can move on to the next picture, Zuri, that is, um, that is showing yet, it's, it's a very compact and dense uh, environment. So um, it's capitalizing on, on density, just like nature does. And um, if you go to the next page, Zuri, that's sort of the overview, the bird's eye view of it, that Yet you have a lot of building, you, have, you, can, you can put a lot of people in there, but the fuzzy stuff in the middle is the greenery. So we use vegetation, uh, which we have plenty and nowhere in the world. The places I have been, uh, lived in Nebraska, I lived in Arizona, uh, nothing of the stuff that we have here, the green stuff uh, grows year round. So this is something, this is a capital that we should capitalize on. So, um, so this is this is that, and the next page um, is me finally revealing sort of what is this made of, because we live here in Hawaii with a scarcity of resources for the for the demand we have, which you know is housing shortage, uh, big times. We don't have anything on the island that we can provide uh, housing. So usually we build houses out of concrete here. A lot of concrete uh, that makes buildings feel hot, or we ship material in from the uh, Pacific Northwest of the mainland, which is wood, gets termite treated, it comes here. By the time the wood comes here, there's nothing sustainable, or very little sustainable about it. And then we gotta put a tarp over it every 10 years and blow poison into it to keep the termites out. 
So, and then it costs tremendously too much money. So this is approaching here to say, maybe we take stuff we have. And I start at the very bottom, you know, this is the picture illustrates, we have one wood species that's invasive, Albicia trees. We all know them from here. They come down when the wind picks up and storms and um, they block the roads and take down power lines. So we all say we need to replace them with native plants, but then we should take advantage and use uh, that kind of wood. And um, uh, here it's supposed to implement uh, a wood um, uh, enhancement process um, that is called from the modified wood. So we process the wood and we use the wood. We don't use the wood for structural things. So whenever in the pictures before everything looks very soft and glowing and warm, that's the part of the wood. It's not structural. So even when the termite gets to it, it won't be a significant problem. It's a minor problem. And wood can be replaced and should be replaced, you know, in intervals. And that could all be done pretty much with sweat equity uh, by the people themselves. The picture above that is that um, if you look at building components, all the new high rises they go up, they have invasive guardrails. And guardrails are the things by code, three feet high, making sure no one falls off. It was actually a, a tragic incident just yesterday in Ala Moana where some of the guard rates came down and unfortunately killed one person and hurt one other one. So our, our default is a mainland approach. It's an invasive approach to guard rails. They have glass. Why is glass bad for that reason? First of all, it needs to be shipped in, high carbon footprint. But the other maybe more important reason is one that we block the trades off because glass is not transparent, it, you know, or it's not it's not permeable, it is transparent, uh, correct myself, but it's not permeable, so the wind cannot go through. So when you remember the pictures before, you hardly saw any guardrail. Inside and outside seem to blur into each other, so we're proposing to repurpose uh, uh, fisher nets. Unfortunately, uh, fishers have, or the industry has switched to uh, plastic material and that never goes away, it doesn't biodegrade. So lots of sea animals, neighbors get stuck in there and, and die in a very tragic way. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie Plastic Paradise, please do so and you will be shocked and you will be sympathetic of this approach to actually make the fishing industry go back to biodegradable uh, fisher net and give us the plastic ones and we use them as guardrail where the wind can go through. And also, you know, our, our kids, because they're curious, they don't stop at three feet. They go on a stool and want to be curious, and then they're endangered. This one is going to cover the whole surface, so you can just set your kids free and tell them to go crazy. The last part, the top picture, is uh, the, the main component. And even here uh, in, the, in the last picture on, on, the, on the previous slide, I call it cargo steel. Because only here on this slide, I finally reveal what it is. And it's something that I didn't say before intentionally because it got stigmatized. Uh, because the projects that we have built with them so far, I allow myself um, to say, haven't been successful. This is shipping containers. So our structure is shipping containers. But I prefer to not say it that way or only at the very end because we don't make anyone live in the container. We live in the space that we create between the containers in open lanai's. Only our bathrooms and restrooms are in the containers. So the next page, the next last five minutes, I'm going to dedicate to what does this have to do with, with Jeff? And this is Jeff back to work. And um, he's actually back to work today, although he shouldn't be at work because he's seriously sick and I'm very worried about him. But he couldn't come here and he said, I have to work. I'm, I have no money, I need this. So he can't even take time off, he can't take sick time. So he's out there again, I'm speaking on behalf of him. Because at one point I have shown Jeff the project and I said, you know, Jeff, um, whenever we talk about the underprivileged, about the underdogs, about the proletariat um, who have a challenge finding a home, or I say a roof, um, like him, would you be willing to move in there? It's different, and I explained to him why it's different, and he basically said, count me in. So I, in this show, I have hopefully done a good job to avoid a couple of terms that I think 
are overrated, are inflated, are uh, sort of hijacked by certain industries and movements. And one of the terms is homeless. Homeless would be the traditional term what Jeff is. But we wanted to make sure that we call this show differently, significantly different. We call it home full because Jeff has a home and his home is Waikiki and we're his neighbors. And if we make sure he has to eat and he has to drink and a place to stay, Jeff is fine. And that is not the case, but it should be the case. So again, Jeff, as you can tell, is an inspiration for me that if we're willing to do unconventional ways, if we allow to think outside of the box, and this sounds funny because, you know, the project might have come across as very boxy to you because it's the nature of a shipping container, it's a box. But if we put it together, not to say we got to stuff and get homeless stuck in there, but we think about these sort of unconventional, contemporary, abundant building materials, and we put them together in a poetic, composed way that is not thought um, sort of architecturally, superficially, surfacially, but it's thought of substantially that we think from inside out rather than outside in. So we don't care how the building looks like. The building would look like the way it feels good. And that's, that's a plateau year. And once again, I hope we can have Jeff on the show and talk more about who he is and where he comes from. It's fascinating. Again, he couldn't come today. I'm worried about him because he's, he's not well. But he gave me permission to speak on behalf of him and on behalf of us. So once again, uh, appreciate your uh, interest and your, uh, and your uh, support for this uh, different show that maybe I didn't smile as much as I usually do, but this is a topic that's very close to me, very tough for me at times and very hardening. So thank you for that. Uh, bear with us next time again on Think Tech Hawaii, Human Humane Architecture on Tuesday early evenings, 5 p.m in our challenged but promising urban fabric of Honolulu, Hawaii. Thank you very much.